it's a special privilege uh, to uh, have one of our uh, young, uh, energetic, uh, bright uh, faculty members uh, to begin our series. Uh, Sabrina Darrow uh, did her uh, undergraduate uh, work, uh, in psychology and Italian studies at the University of Nevada. Um, got her master's in clinical uh, psychology, um, working on a thesis of development of functional assessment and depression, and then continued at the University of Nevada, um, where she got a PhD in entered 2011. Uh, she has uh, uh, been a postdoc fellow in the uh, Clinical Services Research Training Program here at UCSF. Uh, and then uh, has, and has also has been um, a lecturer in the Social Behavioral Science Program here at UCSF. Uh, and also an affiliate faculty in the School of Nursing and Public Health here at UCSF. Uh, she has been um, a DBT therapist uh, and a researcher in the Young Adult Medical Center uh, here at Child Adolescence Factory at UCSF. Uh, I don't know where she had the time, but she has 21 peer-reviewed articles book chapters, 21 professional um, conference uh, presentations, uh, and is also um, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science. So, welcome Sabrina. Thank you, I'm happy to be here to kick off our lecture series today. Um, John hit most of the highlights from my background that I was going to start off with, but one important point that he missed that has shaped a lot of my behavior is my, I grew up in Lake Tahoe, so this is a picture uh, from my parents' house. Um, as he mentioned, I did both my undergraduate and graduate work at the University of Nevada, Reno, and the Reno part's important. Um, uh, one of the things that's really shaped my thinking now is that all, from an, an undergraduate, I had a lot of exposure to behavior analysis. In fact, I started uh, doing applied behavior analysis, precision teaching, and tutoring young kids as an undergraduate. And then my, both my clinical and research training were really consistent from a behavioral perspective. So if you get nothing else from today, you'll know that I'm a behaviorist. <laughs> <clears throat> I did an internship at the Southern Arizona VA, and then, as John mentioned, I've been at UCSF for about six years now. So I worked with Dr. Martha Shumway uh, in the Clinical Services Research Training Program for two years. I was on an R01 grant with Dr. Carol Matthews, looking at the genetics of Tourette's and the comorbid disorders, OCD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders. And then I've been working in the Young Adult and Family Center uh, for about the last two and a half years, really building up our research and evaluation program, as well as being a clinician in the DBT clinic. <coughs> so my research focus is really on clinical behavior analysis, which is the application of behavioral principles to outpatient psychotherapy. I'm interested in improving psychotherapy, and really my interests revolve around the interplay between measurement development and implementation science, so improving clinicians' abilities to implement evidence-based practices. And ultimately, I want to answer the question that everybody does, and uh, Gordon Paul's question of what treatment by whom is the most effective for this individual with this specific problem with, under what set of circumstances. Before we get into the talk, I wanted to just start off with some assumptions that I'm going to make um, that might not always uh, be something that you agree with, but we'll have to agree with this to uh, agree with my talk. Anyway, so the, first off, that the scientific processes can be applied to the human experience and that we should be making data-based decisions when we're um, working on helping improve mental health that we do currently have knowledge and technology to help many people and we can do better. There's lots of evidence that suggests this and I'm not going to be talking about any of that today. That the goal of therapy is behavior change, both to change behaviors in order to decrease people's distress, 
as well as improve their general functioning so that they don't have to come back to treatment. So in this way, it's really a constructionist viewpoint that I'm taking that's in line with positive psychology, right? That I'm not just looking to decrease symptoms and distress, but also increase resilience so people don't come back. And finally, the <laughs> radical behaviorism is pretty cool. So radical behaviorism is a philosophy of science, sometimes called functional contextualism. In some places, people would debate whether or not these things are different. I might say it's just a more effective marketing strategy, uh, but we won't go into that today. So like any philosophy of science, uh, philosophy guides how you approach a problem and, whether, and how you know when you've solved it. So from a radical behaviorist perspective, how I approach a, a problem is that I want to understand an action and context. So instead of just looking at a topography of a behavior, which is what it looks like, I really want to know how it functions in the environment. So for example, the topography might be me saying I'm sad, and this might work on my environment in many different ways. In some cases, it might work to get support. In some cases, it might work to get me out of chores. Um, you can also think about the function of a therapist behavior. So a, a typical topographical therapist behavior is to say something like, thank you for sharing. From a radical, perspective, radical behaviorist perspective, I'm wondering how that works. Well, my intention might be to increase somebody's disclosure of important things. Um, it may not function that way. So if I think you're just doing some weird therapist-y thing, it's not going to actually make me more likely to disclose. Right? So looking really at the function of behavior. How do I know if I've solved a problem? Well, in some sciences, we're really looking for the ultimate causal truth, right? Truth with a capital T. From a radical behaviorist perspective, that's not what I'm doing. I have this pragmatic truth criterion that I just need to know enough to meet my goal. So in this case, I just want to understand behavior enough to know how I can change it. My goals are twofold. I want to be able to predict under which conditions a certain behavior is occurring, but I also want to be able to influence it. So how can I actually change it? And that's different than some scientific approaches. Theories of mental health from a radical behaviorist perspective then focus on the dysfunction between a person and their environment. So there's two pieces of this that I think are really cool. One is that it's really destigmatizing, right? So you're not trying to find the source of dysfunction within a person, but rather looking at how they're interacting in their environment. The other piece of it is putting me as both a scientist and a clinician in the analysis. That's in fact where the radical for radical behaviorism comes from, is that you're actually, as a clinician, I am part of my client's environment. So I'm including my behavior and what I'm doing in any kind of analysis. All right, so now that you understand my background, you'll understand why I set up this talk to provide the context of how I'm thinking about research. So today I am going to be talking some about the evolution of behavior therapies, the current challenges, or some of them, in conducting research on improving psychotherapy, and then I'll be talking about the role of functional assessment, or understanding the function of a behavior, and how that can guide intervention. So to start it off, Start us off, let's talk about the history of clinical psychology. Some of you may or may not know that the roles that clinical psychologists have are relatively new in the scheme of, scheme of things. So in the early 1900s, there weren't really clinical psychologists. Psychologists spent their time developing tests, you can think of Alfred Binet and intelligence testing, um, as well as just really in the lab doing experiments on sensation, perception, understanding the mind. They weren't really focused just on dysfunction, right? But on just the whole continuum of the human experience. Experience, And it was really, psychotherapy was mostly done by psychiatrists at this time of the psychodynamic and psychoanalytician. Um, it wasn't until the world wars, so one and two, that really created more demand that psychologists stepped out of the lab and became clinical psychologists as we know them now. So uh, one, factor that was the armed services asked psychologists to develop tests to be able to predict who would do well in, or not in the military, so selection tests, and that brought psychologists into more of an applied role. 
And then also, as we had our veterans coming back and we started realize, recognizing shell shock, or what we now call PTSD, there was a great demand for more clinicians. And so psychologists stepped into this applied area. So the first wave of behavior therapies reflected this change in roles, that they were taking the theories that they had developed in the lab and directly translating them into their interventions. So they were really focused then on operationalizing behaviors and measuring behaviors. Systematic desensitization is one example. And just in case you needed a refresher from your undergrad psychology course on what these theories were. So there are two main behavior theories. So respondent conditioning. This is Pavlov and his dogs. So you have an unconditioned stimulus, which in this case was food. And then the unconditioned response was salivating. And in fact, we would see the same kind of thing in humans if I started talking about the delicious garlicky pasta primavera that I made for dinner last night, many of you might start salivating. And it just happens. You didn't have to learn anything to do it. It's just something that occurs. The learning occurs when you pair this unconditioned stimulus, so food, with a bell, for example, which is what Pavlov did. And over time, if you present the bell and the food at the same time, you can get a dog to salivate just with the bell. And we could do the same thing if I was ringing a bell while we were talking about my pasta, right? You might just salivate when I ring a bell. The other form of behavioral theory in, uh, was operant conditioning. So here we're thinking about Skinner and his pigeons and boxes, right? So the unit of analysis for operant conditioning is this three-term contingency, antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. And it's really learning by consequences. So the A is the antecedent is the setting conditions. Uh, so in certain conditions, this little dot represents there's some probability that a behavior will occur and it will be followed by a consequence. And it's really these consequences that will either increase the behavior for the behavior to occur again in the future. So reinforcing consequences or punishing consequences, decreasing the likelihood that a behavior will occur again in the future. So it was these theories that they really used to translate into the first wave of behavior therapies. And it turns out there were some problems with it. So there was really little emphasis in this first wave on the interaction between clinicians and their clients. And as mental health providers, we know that the therapeutic relationship is actually really important. And they also really kind of ignored the social context in which any of these behaviors were occurring, which was problematic. Um, and then we have what we call the black box problem. So our natural language really supports us talking about thoughts and feelings as causes of behavior. So I stay in bed because I'm sad. I started ignoring Sabrina because she's boring. Um, I jumped for joy because I was excited, right? Well, behaviorists at the time really seemed like they were ignoring these thoughts and feelings, right? We don't care what's going on in somebody's head. We're just operationalizing the behavior and looking outside of the behavior to see what's going on. On a theory level, this is more problematic for respondent conditioning, not so much for operant conditioning, but the first wave just really didn't translate how we thought about thoughts and feelings from a behavioral perspective into the, ther the therapies. So we saw a second wave of behavior therapies that was really the cognitive revolution when the C and CBT came about. So back in the 1970s, in addition to this black box problem, uh, we also had experiments in the lab that were showing that humans could learn things without having direct contact with the environment. So just by modeling and observation, they can learn new things. And we started thinking that thoughts are more important. So the second wave of behavioral therapies really follow this model where there's an event, an antecedent, something in the environment, you have a thought, and that affects your behavior. So you know, here you guys are all listening to me talk, you might have the thought, oh, Sabrina is very engaging and entertaining, and that might be leading you to pay very close attention to everything that I'm saying. Or you might think, like, oh, she's boring and I have better things to do, so you'll be on your phone. Um, <laughs> Kind of right at the same time, the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, came up with this technology model of research. So it was this idea of how can we make research on psychotherapy as rigorous and controlled as drug trials. So under this model, we're saying that researchers have to specify what are the techniques that people are doing when they're doing therapy, 
how are you going to train therapists to do these techniques, and how are you going to monitor and make sure that they're actually doing the things that you want them to do, right? So this real focus on specifying our independent variables of therapy um, and monitoring whether or not that was really being implemented. And CBT was very well prepared to meet these requirements because these therapies came from the lab, right? So those psychologists that are coming from the lab into the field and we're used to operationalizing. And as a result, most of the, um, a good majority of the research at this time on psychotherapy was really done on CBTs. And then it also resulted in this research practice gap, which I'm sure many of you have heard or experienced, right? So on the research side of things, we have this big focus on empirically supported treatments, that there are these packages, you have to follow a manual, the manual tells you what to do on session one, session two, that we really are caring to specify our independent variable, um, that we're also doing this research within the medical model, so we had a manual for each diagnosis that somebody might have, and there was this big emphasis on uh, internal validity, so really sticking to the treatment manual, right? Then on the practice side, there's just too many manuals. So if you have a manual per diagnosis, um, and that's not even the beginning of it, right? The last time I did a search on Guilford Press, which is a, a popular public um, publisher for manuals, I searched CBT for depression, and there's over 130 results. <laughs> So it would be really hard then as a clinician to be like, well, which manual should I do and how do, you know, how do I apply it? Also, we know that this didn't really match up with the reality of who was coming into the clinics and seeking treatment. That in fact, we had complex cases, people that are meet, meeting criteria for more than one disorder. And we know now from epidemiological studies that this is actually more of the rule than the, the exception, that most, a good chunk of people meet criteria for more than one disorder. And it's particularly true for the people that come and seek treatment, that they are much more likely to meet criteria for more than one disorder. And so then you're kind of left as a clinician, well, which manual of the 130 do I use for depression? And then, you know, there's all these over for anxiety, and how do I do it if I do one in session one, and then the second one in session two, right? And the other really uh, big gap was a very strong focus on technique on the research side and not a focus on these things that we call common factors like the therapeutic relationship. So it was in this context that the third wave of behavior therapies were developed. Depending on who you talk to, the third wave can be defined in a couple of different ways. So one way is to understand that this was really a clinical behavior analysis, so direct translation of behavioral theories into practice. And that the, the part that was new was that we really had had some more advances in the basic science side of how we understand verbal behavior or thoughts and feelings, and that we can use these to you know, improve the treatments from the first wave. And then we also had these component analyses by Jacobson and colleagues that looked at what are the different parts of CBT for depression? So they compared the full package CBT to just giving people the <coughs> cognitive intervention to just giving people the behavioral part, the behavioral activation. And what they found was that the behavioral part could stand alone. And it's been replicated now, and that led to behavioral activation being a standalone treatment for depression. Some people also define third wave as therapies that have started to incorporate things such as acceptance, mindfulness, relationships, and spirituality. And then another thing that these therapies have in com common is that they really kind of got away from this idea of a manual having to be a session by session playbook, right? That they're really these principle-based manuals that describe you should follow these principles, this is how you can use these principles to understand the causes of these different um, different problems, and they're meant also to be applied transdiagnostically, that they weren't principles that just fit for a certain disorder. So here are some examples of third wave behavior therapies. So dialectical behavior therapy was developed by Marsha Linehan up at NUW. This was really meant for individuals who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder, who have a history of chronic suicidality and self-harm. 
acceptance and commitment therapy was developed by Stephen Hayes at University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, this was really a direct translation of relational frame theory, which is one of <coughs> the ways that behaviorists understand verbal behavior, thoughts and feelings. Functional analytic therapy came from up in UW, so Kohlenberg and Psy. This was a direct translation of clinical behavior analysis to the therapeutic relationship. How can we understand how the therapist may be a source of social reinforcement, and that's how uh, behavior is changed, actually, through the interactions in the therapy room. And then, as I mentioned, behavioral activation. <clears throat> so again, as a reminder, if we're coming from this clinical behavior analytic standpoint, radical behaviorism, we're looking at behavior tests, right? The context here being defined as the antecedents, the setting conditions of behaviors, as well as the consequences of what may maintain or decrease a behavior. So how does one go about assessing the context of a behavior? Uh, so functional analysis, this, I'm gonna give an example that's actually most, been applied most well, strange wording, um, by an applied behavior analyst working with developmental disabilities and in the autism spectrum disorders. So if you take, for example, an individual who is head banging, which is a common problem behavior you can see in, in kids um, in those populations. The idea behind functional analysis is that you can bring an individual into a room and you can change the setting conditions. So you might uh, place a demand on them, ask them to do a task, that might be one condition. Another condition might be that you're letting them play and you're over here you're doing something else, right? And so you actually vary the setting conditions and see, well, when does the head banging occur? And from there, you can start varying the consequences to see if you can change that behavior. So different people head bang for different reasons. It's functions on their environment differently. And so from a functional analysis, you come up with this personalized case conceptualization. So if somebody um, often head bangs in a way that they get out of demands, then your case conceptualization would focus on interventions of how you can get them to do other things to get out of demands. There's this intimate link in a behavioral approach between assessment and treatment. You can think of it as an alternating treatment design, if you're familiar with single case study and design, where you're going to try one thing, measure it, see if it works, back off, don't do it anymore, and does the behavior come back, try it again, right? And so you're really assessing, trying it out, and then seeing if it works. In practice, in outpatient psychotherapy, functional analysis is very hard to do. We don't always have access to the controlling variables, the antecedents and consequences of, um, of the behaviors that we're trying to change, and the behaviors we're trying to change are complex. Um, there's really no formalized method of how you can go about doing a functional analysis in outpatient psychotherapy. And so instead we use what can be known as descriptive functional assessments, which means that we're not actually changing the antecedents and, and consequences, we're doing things like observing the behaviors and seeing if we can identify patterns in the antecedents and consequences, or asking our clients, you know, what happened before that, what happened afterwards. So let's go back and see, well, so how well are these third wave behavior therapies doing at closing the research and practice gap? Such that they're getting more people interested in using these behavioral approaches and they're doing it well. So we're gonna talk about DBT as a case example. Um, so this is uh, a description of an individual that doesn't really match one individual from my practice in this last year or so. So Rachel is a 17 year old biracial female, uh, presented to the DET clinic as is uh, common with most of our kiddos, that they, she spent the last year kind of in and out of hospitals due to suicidal behaviors and self-harm, spent a bunch of time in residential treatments. She met criteria for a number of disorders, so she didn't meet criteria for borderline personality disorder, but displayed a few traits such as affect and stability, uh, chronic sense of emptiness. <coughs> and she also met criteria for major depressive disorder, social anxiety disorder, anorexia nervosa, and partial remission. So a complex case, right? And DBT was actually made for cases like this. This is why it was developed. 
So what does DBT treatment look like? So Rachel came to see me for a weekly individual session. She and her parents attended Ashley's multi-family skills group. And then she and her parents also came to family session with me every other week where I helped them apply the skills Ashley was teaching them to their family interactions. And I was available 24 hours for skills coaching for Rachel. And then I attended a weekly team meeting with these lovely individuals that are sprinkled around here to make sure that I was doing DBT as well as I could and to prevent burnout. The skills that we cover in DBT are mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, and middle path. Um, I'll go into those a little bit more. So here's where there's very clear application of behavioral principles in DBT responding to life-threatening behavior. So this is the first thing you wanna do when somebody comes in, you gotta keep them alive to help them, right? So you gotta decrease those life-threatening behaviors. So the first thing we do is a functional assessment of self-harm and suicidal behaviors. In DBT, we talk about this as a chain analysis. So I worked with Rachel to, uh, we identified a recent incidence of self-harm and we talked about what was going on before then. So it turns out she had this you know, vulnerability ongoing of a depressed mood that often before she would self-harm that there was some demand her parents were placing on her and there was always some very big emotions that she was dealing with. And when she self-harmed, it worked to decrease, to escape from those big emotions. And often the demands from her parents were withdrawn and they increased their supportive behaviors afterwards. So with this analysis, then I did uh, stimulus control, which is an intervention that's really based on the antecedents. So antecedents um, if, of self-harm, some of it is just having access to the means to do it, right? So we, we worked with Rachel and her parents to get rid of the, the means. And so to get rid of those antecedents for self-harm. And then we also worked with on contingency management, so changing the consequences. How can her parents be warm and supportive often, but not increase that after she's doing these ineffective behaviors? Because that might inadvertently be reinforcing her self-harm. <coughs> So what to do next, right? Here's um, where we have lots of options. So one of the things that I might do is differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, DRL, or for those familiar, DRI, DRA, I don't, I'm not gonna split hairs, but what does this mean? So rather than, when you're trying to decrease the behavior, um, while adding punishing consequences can be done well with care, there's often some dangers in doing that. And so instead, you work to increase some other behavior in that same setting. So this is, and, and really try to build in reinforcement for doing something else in that same setting. So in DVT terms, we talk about this as distress tolerance. So in the setting of having high emotions, how can you do something else? Play your guitar, you know, go take a shower, hold some ice. I don't really care, but I'm gonna reinforce the hell out of you for doing anything except for cutting, right? Hopefully parents are too. I might think about doing exposure. So because we could understand that self-harm was this escape behavior from really intense uh, emotions, then we want to expose Rachel to those intense emotions and prevent the escape behavior. In DVT terms, we might talk about this and do it by teaching mindfulness. Another alternative would be to increase access to response contingent reinforcement. A long way of saying behavioral activation. Um, so this would be really targeting that vulnerability of depressed mood, right? So we could work with Rachel to help her be engaged in school, go meet some new friends, get involved with activities in the community, and hope that there was something reinforcing about doing some of those, and that would decrease her depressed mood and then her vulnerability to self-harm. In DBT terms, we talk about this as emotion regulation or opposite action. Finally, I might also choose to address a skills deficit. So because this other common link that led to self-harm was increased demands from parents, that we might understand self-harm as a very ineffective way of communicating that I don't want to do that, right? So I might work with Rachel to come up with more effective ways to talk to her parents and negotiate around um, demands, chores. And in DBT terms, 
we talk about that as interpersonal effectiveness acronym is DEARGAN. How do I choose between these things? It turns out that the DBT manual doesn't really give me a lot of guidance in doing that. And in fact, um, we find that there's a lot of variability in practice in where we choose to, to go. And as a clinician, it's hard, it's hard to know which would be the better, uh, the better path. What we also find in practice is that some clinicians get, and I'm sure I, myself included, you get really focused on one piece of this because either it's easy, you like it, or it makes sense. And then this is actually a problem for us when we're going to refer people to DBT therapists where we find that they, they are really stuck on doing mindfulness and saying they're doing DBT. It's part of DBT. Is that the active component? I'm not sure. So, and then you'll notice, none of these things on the screen now are behavioral terms, right? These aren't the principles that match up to the basic behavior science that we know in the lab. What are they? So this is actually a common uh, problem with many of the third wave, well, problem in my opinion, of the third wave behavior therapies that we've really chosen to focus on these middle level terms. So rather than teach people the technically correct terms that match up with our behavioral theories, we use these terms that are pragmatic ways that we think helps orient people to these same functional domains. It's a problem for me as a researcher because by definition, these are not testable. So the, the manuals really aren't focused then on the behavioral principles and how you make the decisions based on your functional assessment. Um, and it's also, you can understand GBT in particular as this kitchen sink approach where you're just kind of throwing all the skills at everybody and you're gonna hope that something sticks rather than matching them to the key part of it that you think will really work for that person, right? So then as a researcher, when I'm thinking about, well, how can I improve DBT? Because we know that DBT doesn't help everybody. Uh, often, even in our clinic, people are staying to do stage two work, so they're continuing to need services. Um, we want to be able to do a theoretically meaning, meaningful component analysis. So which are the behavioral principles that are really guiding the treatment for which individual? So like any good researcher, when I'm thinking about this question, I'm going to start by building some kind of model. So <laughs> here's the model that I started to build for DBT. These are the middle level terms, um, only a few of them from the manual. And as you can see, when I really started thinking about it, it seems like there's a lot of different things that we do that function differently. And so it didn't really leave me with this clear, testable model where I could start saying, well, if we take out this component, then we can see if that was the, the key ingredient or not, right? And it really gets more complicated. So DBT has done a really great job of increasing everyone's interest, not everyone's, many people's interest in behavioral approaches. So lots of people are interested in DBT. The evidence that it's effective has really increased as well. And as this has happened, we've applied it to more and more conditions. So we have DBT for substance use, DBT for eating disorders, DBT for bipolar. And so Marsha, of course, came out with another manual trying to be helpful to people. Um, so here's a picture of my original skills manual. You can see it's about a, a half an inch. That <laughs> and here's the second edition with the graph of the increase in page numbers, worksheets, and handouts, and I would like to have put acronyms, but I didn't get around to that. Um, so it, it's really this complicated picture. So then, so what do we do next? How do we move our field forward? <coughs> so my colleague, Glenn Callahan, he's down at San Jose State, and I wrote this paper where we are trying to anticipate the fourth wave of behavior therapy. So what do we do next? And the things that we talked about it, that we think need to happen are really making functional assessment the primary driver of interventions. So that we need to use functional assessments across interventions and not presuppose a certain treatment package, right? Which means that we're not really interested in building a new treatment package, but really these assessments. So in my research, I'm trying to focus on two things and really kind of going back to the basics, right? So one is I want to be able to clarify and streamline what are the behavioral principles that we're actually doing when we're doing a treatment like DBT. 
And then how can I help clinicians make these ongoing decisions of, about treatment? So I really see, if this isn't clear, assessment as the key link, right? And I think that assessments, more than manuals, can really be tools for clinicians. I'm not going to drag those manuals off the bookshelf, especially not 130 of them, or you know, even my five inches of DBT uh, skills, into a therapy session. But the results of an assessment or even a self-report, that's something that absolutely I can bring with me and can help guide my decisions. I think that it has to have a few key features. So it has to have, um, it has to be individualized. We have to actually acknowledge that there are multiple pathways to any behavior and we have to really be assessing that. It has to be iterative. So if I give an assessment just at the beginning of treatment and then I say, okay, I'm good to go, that's not actually gonna help me guide my, my, my treatment, right? So I need something that I can integrate into my treatment that really can help me make all of the decisions along the way. And then I think it needs to be tied to mechanisms of change. And this is really key, especially if we're thinking about doing research on how we would move things forward. And then if we develop something like this, oh my, it's got messed up. Um, we can use these kinds of assessments to build kind of treatment decision algorithms that would really be useful for clinicians and that could also be tied to basic behavioral research. So this is where my current research, uh, where I've gotten with my current research. So right now, um, I'm harnessing digital technology and I've developed a beta version of a mobile behavioral assessment, I'm calling it TRAPU. Um, it's really meant to be something like a diary card we use in DBT that you can personalize. So you can put up uh, individual's goals. It's not, I'm not saying what the behaviors are that you're tracking from the beginning. Um, and then the first thing that I'm interested in looking at is reinforcement learning. So I have this in quotes for a couple of reasons. One is because it, I'm really asking people this proxy for reinforcement, right? So I'm not doing a functional assessment where I'm directly manipulating things, but I'm asking them to report things such as if they enjoyed something, if they were satisfied, hoping that this gets me uh, some measure of whether or not it's reinforcing, gonna increase the likelihood of them get engaging in a particular behavior. The other reason is that I'm not referring to just operant conditioning in general. This really, reinforcement learning, this label really comes from the RDOC. So NIMH has this research domain criteria, which is this experimental framework that they're asking researchers to try rather than uh, diagnosis, but to use these constructs that we think go across diagnoses and can be tied to basic behavioral science. So reinforcement learning is in the uh, positive affect domain of the RDOC, and it really refers to how uh, sensitive an individual is to changes in the reinforcing contingencies in their environment. So I'm also looking at ways to match clients to a particular treatment. So one of the things um, I started developing actually as part of my master's project was a self-report called the FAD, because you have to have a good acronym, uh, the functional assessment of depression, which might be familiar to some of you because I've been trying to collect data from a clinic-based population on this, and I'm interested in adapting it to adolescents. The idea behind this assessment is that there are many ways that people become depressed. Some ways uh, might be having relationship distress. Some might be having difficulty identifying domains of reinforcers or values. And so that's what this uh, self-report is trying to get at. I'm also looking at the diary card data. So this is from the DBT clinic here. Um, and I'm working with John Preeves, who's here in the audience, a Cal student, is helping us out. And we're gonna examine the stability of suicide ideation or self-harm at the beginning of DBT to see how, how that predicts treatment outcome and whether or not it will help us inform ways that we could adapt DBT to make it more efficient or effective. And I'm also working with the DBT team who developed this measure of adolescent skill confidence, asking adolescents to report their confidence in different situations that map on to emotion dysregulation, distress tolerance, things like that, to see if that would actually help us tailor DBT treatment more. And finally, I'm working on adapting DBT to really um, make this protocol that focuses on how we can help people to uh, be better at responding to changes in reinforcing contingencies in their environment 
Um, there's lots of uh, data to suggest that, that this might decrease anhedonia, um, and that is something that we see. Uh, there's at least like 30% of our DBT samples still report some anhed anhedonia at the end of uh, treatment when they graduate. And that's it. Mm. <laughs> Any questions? So, um, are you, how direct are you being with, um, with patients and families in terms of the uh, technical terms? How do, okay, the question, how yeah, direct are, am I being? Are, are you, in your, yeah. as part of your app development and such, are you, like, are you using, are you, are you being more um, uh, direct about the, what the thing yeah. actually mean? I'm going to repeat it because of the other sites. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, like, how direct am I being with patients and families about using technical behavioral yeah. terms like reinforcement and yeah. punishment? So um, in my my research thus far, I'm, I am not being direct, but it is this something that I am really interested in. So this journey I've gone through, right, and doing DBT where I started doing it with adults where we don't talk about that, right? Um, now that I'm working with adolescents, the way that we've adopted DBT for adolescents is the middle path module. We actually are teaching parents and families behaviorism. So I'm like, yes, like why aren't we just doing that? Like if, you know, we, we've, we've kind of said like, oh, clinicians can't learn this, like patients can't learn this, and I, I don't know, I wonder, like, why, why wouldn't we try to be more direct and teach people? When I think about like what's my ultimate goal as a clinician, I am thinking, like how can I teach my patient to be their own behavior analyst? How can they arrange their environment so that they are doing the things that they want to be doing and really reaching their goals? So I do, with my patients, talk a lot directly. I haven't really translated that into any of the research I'm doing yet. So given that the therapist is part of the equation, right, in the behavior, and uh, sometimes therapists can be resistant to do something new, right? Like even I love data when you're like, here you go do this questionnaire, I'm like, ah, another thing, I can't do it. Uh, so I'm wondering what the research shows or just your anecdotal evidence about how much we have to work with reinforcing clinicians to use these systems. Yeah, great, great question. So I'm going to repeat it again. So um, the question is, because therapists are really part of the analysis from this perspective, and that parent therapists can be resistant to change as anybody else, like what's the data on how much we have to work with clinicians to re reinforce that? I don't, I don't know about the data as far as, I mean, the data are that, yes, clinicians don't necessarily like to do that. Um, that um, it's been it's been challenging to, to change people's behavior, and um, you know when you kind of look at how many people are receiving empirically supported treatments, even even that is um, re really telling in um, in the challenge that we face. So of course, yes, I think like um, being able to reinforce therapists um, would be really important, and it, that's why I really like being an implementation scientist, that I really like my role working in a clinic and talking to clinicians and working on both like the antecedent end, like how can we work something like an assessment into your workflow. Um, what we found in our, our our clinics is that, you know, while everybody's kind of pushing like, let's do it all electronic, and I'm saying, yeah, let's do it all electronic, I don't want to be entering data, um, that that's actually not the, the what clinicians prefer because just depending on what's happening that day or what you have to do with a certain client to ask them to do it, um, to complete an assessment, having the flexibility where you can hand it to them on pa paper, where you can have them do it at home, you can email it to them, having all of those options is something that makes it, it, it facilitates that. I think the other piece of it, like the reinforcing piece of it, it's really when I think about um, clinical utility. So if I ask you to give an assessment and it doesn't help you, you already know what treatment you're gonna do and it doesn't tell you anything about what you should or shouldn't be doing differently, then why would you pay attention to it, right? Like on the one hand, we do know that when you're implementing assessments that we get better outcomes regardless of the intervention that you're doing. Um, and I think that we could get more people to do it if we actually are giving them tools that are useful. 
along those lines, um, I'm curious what you found in the research in terms of what's reinforcing to the client. Because, you know, my experience is that we give these assessments and sometimes they don't come back or it's annoying or they roll their eyes or whatever. And I'm just wondering if we could do it slightly differently so that the clients are more on board with it, you know? And, and what have other people done and what have you found that... that so so the, the question is how to make... Um, uh, how to reinforce clients for doing assessments because often they uh, we give them an assessment and they don't they don't do it um, and what does the research shows uh, so I, I would love to hear your ideas about ways that you could reinforce a client right so when you're thinking about reinforcement there is no cookie cutter approach so I can for some clients say I'll give you a sticker and someone could say like F you I don't care about stickers um, and some are like working really hard for that cute little doggy sticker that I'm going to give them if they bring it back right so it really just depends um, I do think when I when I talk to clinicians about um, why and how they should give an assessment. I think that it can, the part of it that can be reinforcing is if you really, if you talk about it and you explain to them what you're doing and why you're asking them to do it. Um, for some, it can be really reinforcing to see progress, right? So if you're thinking about giving like a symptom measure and they see, you know, yeah, I kind of knew that I was feeling better, but look at that huge drop in the numbers that that can be. So one of the things that I think about in designing systems is actually having some feedback to the clients where there's some kind of visualization that they can see. But I don't have any any other brilliant ideas, and I welcome any. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much.